The following video is one of five recordings from the Environmental Lands Management Field Day presented by the University of Florida IFAS South Florida Beef Forage Program on Thursday, March 31st, 2022 at the UF IFAS Range Cattle Research and Education Center in Ona, Florida. All right, so I just kind of want to give a, basically a 50,000 foot view of weed management and pastures. I'm going to focus primarily on improved pastures, but a lot of this can carry over to native rangeland as well. I'm not going to talk too much about wetlands. So if you have questions about wetlands, uh, weed control and wetlands, let me know and we can talk about that later today. So what I wanted to cover is go over kind of our current tools and our herbicides. Uh, why do we control weeds? I think for some of you, it's pretty obvious, but some of you, it may not be very obvious. And then I'm going to touch on four or five different species that I feel are the most problematic as far as invasives in Florida. All right. So this is basically our current toolbox of herbicides that we have to use in pastures. If you go into situations uh, where you have wetlands interspersed within the pastures, there are different chemicals that you have to use. You have to pay attention to labels. And that's where the fun happens, right? Because you get to open that little pack up on the side of the jug and try to read that fine print. You have to borrow Maria's glasses to, to be able to read it. Sorry, Maria. <clears throat> but anyway, there's several different um, products on the market. So all of these are what we refer to as active ingredients. So there's various trade names of these. I mean, there are so many generic products out there. It kind of gets confusing. And one of my mentors, when I was in graduate school in Missouri, he actually said, herbicide companies like to can them and confuse them because they just had different premixes and, and different generic names for a lot of different things. On this right hand side, these are some of the more commonly used trade names um, that are used uh, pretty much throughout the state of Florida. A couple of them are kind of weird that we don't use very often, only in certain situations. I'm not going to go into a lot of that today. But kind of like Maria said earlier about fertilizer, people just don't go out and apply fertilizer willy nilly. They usually have a purpose. <clears throat> So I wanted to bring that up because a lot of people, when they see a sprayer out in the pasture or whatever, they think, oh, they're poisoning the earth. And that's not necessarily true because not just going out to spend money to spend money. Okay. So <clears throat> another thing is, is that the pesticides that are sold in the U.S. are highly regulated by the EPA. And there's a lot of effort today, not so much back when Agent Orange and DDT were first brought to the market, but today there's a lot of effort that goes into ensuring the proper use of pesticides in pastures, road crops, you name it. There's a lot that goes into that. In fact, it costs upwards of 300 million to bring a single molecule from discovery to market. And I think that price continues to climb every year. So this table over here on the right, um, this shows the LD50. So if you don't know what that means, it's a lethal dose to cause death of 50% of the population. So the lower the number, the more lethal it is, the higher the number, the safer it is. All right, so several of the pesticides that have been used in the US here on the left of this table, and you'll see things like amino pyrrolid. So this is in products like I had in the previous slide, Milestone, Grazenex, Duracore, Chaparral. Amino pyrrolid is a component of all of, the, all of the four of those herbicides. It contains over 5,000 milligrams per kilogram to kill a rat. Okay, so these are all rat, based on rat data. So the glyphosate's right there, it's the same thing. So it takes over 5,000 milligrams per kilogram to kill a rat. So, um, so overall, really say, does that mean we don't use protection like gloves and goggles and, and leather boots, long sleeve shirts? Of course. Why? One the reason the label tells us we should and the labels federal law. The other reason is 
we don't want to expose ourselves to that type of stuff. But look at some of the other things that we do expose ourselves to daily that have OD50s a lot of times that are much smaller than a lot of the pesticides we use today. So just to give you a little bit of perspective on safety of pesticides versus some of the similar things that we use, not similar, some of the things we use every day. Caffeine, we all need it. And it's only 200, right? So, and table salt, we all need it. Everything needs salt. All right. So get off that soapbox and start going into why we actually want to control weeds. And so we've talked about growing things today. Krista talked about using native rangeland. Maria talked about fertilizing um, to promote forage growth. And I'm sitting here telling you how to kill things. My job's so much more fun. All right, <clears throat> so why do we do this? Well, one, they compete with desirable forage. We also, if we get rid of the weeds, not all weeds are bad as far as palatability and nutritive value, but a lot of times cattle tend not to eat it. So we want to increase forage quality by getting rid of those weeds. We want to decrease the likelihood of toxic plants. Lantana, toxic plant that's found in uh, pastures quite a bit. So we, we want to get rid of those. We want to increase grazing areas, and I'm going to show some slides on that in, here in a minute, but also environmental protection. Invasive species in the state of Florida are a huge concern. I don't think I have to tell many people that in this room. So we want to protect our environment as much as we can by keeping the invasives out, or at least limit them as much as we can. All right, so I talked about incre increasing grazing area. So here I'm gonna talk about grazing interference. So all these plants, so we have Mexican prickly poppy, tropical sour apple, and then Natal's thistle, and these three pictures. All three of these plants have one thing in common. They all have spines. What cow do you picture wanting to go put their nose in the middle of that plant to get the grass that's underneath it? Very few. I wouldn't. I don't even like to walk through them. Especially the tropical soda apple, because those spines do hurt once they get through your genes. Okay. So that's just one, one thing. So do all plants have spines? Absolutely not. But there are still issues in some pastures where you don't think there's really a problem. So I don't know how well this shows up in the room, but I'm going to try to show with the pointer. This bahia grass is gray is fairly short right through here. And you can see pockets where it's gray short and you can see pockets of taller bahia grass. Can you see that in the room? All right, so first glance you think, well, they're just, there's not enough cows here to actually graze this patch properly. But when you start looking closer, we started finding this plant called a milk pea. So when you focus in, on these pastures, wherever it's gray short, there's none of that milk pea present, but where the grass is taller, the milk pea is there. So cows selectively grazed around that milk pea. So it's another reason we want to increase our grazing areas. So this was some work that was done uh, with the University of Missouri, Dr. Kevin Bradley, uh, several years ago now. Uh, but I like to show this slide because I think it really drives home the point of the purpose of weed control and pastures. All right, so they put GPS collars on cows and every time that cow bent over to graze, it recorded a spot in that pasture. So this was prior to herbicide treatment. And this, the yellow side is gonna be the side that they're going to treat and the blue side is the side that they left untreated. So they go back um, four months later and they're using the treated side of the pasture about three times more than the untreated side. So they increase grazing area, but I think there's some other things that we don't think about, at least I don't think about all the time, because like, yeah, they control weeds. They, of course they, they increase their grazing area, but think about the other things that go along with this. If these cows are only grazing in these areas where there's no weeds present, where do you think their excrement is? It's not out in here where there's no fixed spots. More than likely, it's here in these confined spots. Instead of 
throughout the entire treated area this past year. So I think there's other things to think about other than just increasing grazing areas, also distribution of nutrients in the pasture. Okay, so I tell my, my cattle ranchers, if this slide does not get you about excited about weed control, nothing ever will. Because I, I really think this really drives home the point. All right, so like I said, there's four or five different species I really wanted to hit on today. Um, of course, there are others, but I tried to pick the ones that I felt are most pr problematic, ones that I have data on, and one that I feel is kind of a success story that took us about 20 years. Okay, so the first one that I feel is kind of a success story is tropical soda apple. So this is a species that came in in the 1990s, a huge problem. Um, I saw pictures when I was first hired in Hendrick County, pastures just 100% solid tropical soda apple. From a weed science perspective, to do research, phenomenal. From a from a ranch management perspective, horrible, right? Um, so there was a lot of work that was done with tropical soda apple, and initially, the recommendation was to mow. Then you come back four to six weeks later and spray Remedy or Triclopyr when the plants were at flower. So you had the cost of mowing and then you had the cost of the herbicide application. Come back about 70 days after that herbicide application and you have about a thousand seedlings about this tall surrounding everything that was dead from mowing and herbicide application. So it was a quick fix, but it wasn't a long-term fix, okay? Back in 2003 and four, uh, at the time, Dow AgriSciences was working with Amino Pyrrolid. That was a product that they brought to market. And they started investigating that. And the benefit to Amino Pyrrolid was that it not only had post-emergence, so it killed existing plants, it also had some soil residual to help pick up those seedlings. So with Remedy, 70 days, they go back, see seedlings, with amino pyrrolid, 70 days, you wouldn't see seedlings. In fact, it took sometimes upwards of six months before you see chocolate soda apple seedlings again after amino pyrrolid applications. So if you're in a situation today uh, with chocolate soda apple, we have three products in, for Bahia grass, uh, Milestone at five to seven ounces, Grazenex at 24 ounces, or Duracore and that Duracore is our newest herbicide in the pasture market. It actually contains a brand new active ingredient in it. The driver that's really killing the soda apple is the aminopyrrolid. Um, I will say in this part of the state, south, pretty much you can spray these any time of the year. The caveat is if you do end up with a frost within 24 hours or so of application, you tend to see decreased activity. It looks like for a while that it, plants are not going to come back. Um, we actually did a trial in the Bell back in 2008, I think. <clears throat> it's been a while. Uh, we sprayed in February, got a frost that same night, came back in May, and the soda apple plants are starting to regrow from the root system. So, in fact, they were regrowing, but they're very deformed. They looked exactly what we'd expect from these amino pyrrolid is an oxen type herbicide, so it causes rapid twisting of stems. And that's kind of what we're seeing on this re-emerging plant from the root system. However, by September, it flowered and had produced fruit. So even though it came up deformed, it was able to grow itself out of it, okay? So any time of the year, um, if you do have a frost event, just make sure the plants are actively growing. So. We had three nights of frost the end of January. I'm comfortable today going out and spraying plants that have re-sprouted from the root system. But I wouldn't have been a month ago because they just haven't been growing enough from the root system, okay? Uh, for other forages other than Bahia grass, uh, chaparral is another herbicide that's a premix of amino pyrrolid plus a metsulfuron. Very good herbicide can be used in limpergrass, Bermuda grass, star grass. 
more than likely, most people today are spot spraying for soda apple. I mean, there are certain cases where you're not, but <clears throat> more than likely today you're spot spraying. And with Remedy, the spot treatment was 1.4 ounces per gallon, which is about a 1% solution. With aminopyrrolate, it is that much more active. It doesn't take as much herbicide. So that's one of the other benefits of aminopyrrolate is it doesn't take as much product. You're not putting as much herbicide into the environment. So for milestone, it's 0.11%. And we're to look at a tenth of what we used with Remedy. So that equates to about three teaspoons per gallon. Who's gonna measure that? So I tell people an ounce per five gallons, that's a, a pretty good mix. Grazen next uh, is one ounce per gallon and then Duracore is a half percent or three ounces and five gallons. Very important that we do spray the entire plant. Now I did say I felt that our tropical soda apple story was a success story. And I think it's because yes, we had herbicides, but we also had other tools. And one of those tools was first released in Polk County in 2003. And most people will refer to this as a soda apple beetle. So this was brought in in the, I believe in the mid nineties, it had to go through a lot of different testing, much like herbicides do in the containment facility over in Fort Pierce. So they have to test so many different species and make sure that they're very excited about weed control in there. Um, <laughs> they had to test to make sure <laughs> that the beetle would not pick an important crop as a host. So since tropical soda apples is the same family as tomatoes, eggplants, potatoes, I wanted to make sure that this would not affect those plants. And in fact, they found that the beetles would land on potatoes, tomatoes, but they would never feed. So that was pretty neat. So it was actually 100% specific host uh, for that beetle. So those were released. Uh, they're pretty much, I would say ubiquitous throughout I-4 South. Sometimes they're hard to find, other times they're not. I don't know what's going on in that room. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so we have the soda apple beetle. The, the disadvantage to the soda apple beetle is that it would go through what they call diapause. So October, November, you wouldn't see it any longer. And then December, November, December, you start to see a bunch of soda apple seedlings coming up, flourishing. The beetles wouldn't come back until March to April. So you had this window of opportunity for the soda apple to come up and kind of rear its ugly head for a while before the soda apple beetles did come back. Do these kill plants? If you have enough of them on one plant, probably, but in the grand scheme of things, they don't necessarily kill plants. For biocontrol to work, you have to have living plants to stay there. Otherwise, the beetle's going to die too. So it does reduce fruit number. It does reduce seed number. So it's part of the picture and making this work. Another product that came out, uh, I don't remember the exact time right now, but a product named Solvanix, which is a tobacco mild green mosaic virus. Uh, this was produced in a lab in Gainesville. It is a systemic virus, so there's no need to, to spray the entire plant like there is with a herbicide. The problem is getting it into the plant. So most people are used to spraying, you know, mist onto, onto plants with a herbicide to kill. This, you actually have to injure the plant first and then spray it. So you can injure the plant first and spray it, or you can ver use very high pressure to penetrate uh, the leaf cells. It is very active, 83 to 90% mortality. It doesn't take much, uh, 200 milligrams per acre, <clears throat> um, and best when applied during the summer. So this is what you would expect if you were applying uh, Solvanix. Within 30 days, you're gonna have complete death of the plant. So I don't know how widely salt available Solvanix is. I believe the company is still around. Um, that's something I'll have to look into if you're interested in investigating that any further. All right. 
the other species, which I went from one extreme, which I feel is a great success story to one that we're still floundering on, um, which is Kogan grass. Um, this was a huge problem worldwide. Um, I think most people know that it's limited to uh, the tropical and subtropical areas, not so much in the temperate regions of the US. It was introduced accidentally into Mobile, Alabama around 1911. And then some int intentional introductions, one in Mississippi and two in Florida, Gainesville and Brooksville. So you can go back to the old ag experiment station uh, handbooks or manuals or reports, whatever you want to call them. And they were actually investigating this as a forage in the mid thirties, 1930s. And it, it's interesting to read the report first year, grew well, cattle grazing very well, cattle look good. I'm using analog data right now. <clears throat> Next year, poor grows very rapidly, cattle not grazing, cattle look horrible. So with one year of that being established, Kogan grass, they already knew Kogan grass wasn't something they were gonna investigate any further, okay? All right, so why is it such a huge problem? Maria talked about the rich soils that we have low organic matter, low fertility, low pH, okay? So Kogan really likes this environment. It's adapted to full sun, but it'll also adapt to low light as well. And in Florida, we, especially this part of the state, we grow, go through a wet and dry season, okay? So Kogan grass is able to withstand that because it will sacrifice its above ground tissue to keep its rhizome mass alive. <clears throat> so you, you're left standing with a lot of dead biomass above ground, which is extremely pyrogenic. It loves fire and it burns much hotter than our native rangeland would burn. So if you have Kogan grass there in native rangeland and you light a fire that looks like this, more than likely that fire is so hot it's gonna kill any native species that's there. So it's pretty impressive. It also does have allelopathic um, activity through exuding chemicals through the root system, but also we have seen cone grass rhizomes growing through the roots of oak and Brazilian pepper tree roots. It is amazing what these roots can penetrate. Another thing that I'll tell you that uh, my colleagues have determined over the years is if you go out into a pasture or whatever, and you're walking in Kogan grass this tall, and think about how much biomass is there, 80 to 90% of the biomass of the entire plant is below ground. That's one of the reasons it is such a difficult plant to control is because not only do we have to kill what's above ground, we have to kill what's below ground. And that's where we have to really work hard to uh, take that out. I already talked about the fire. So what do we do about it? <clears throat> and I probably switched these slides. So I'm going to go forward a slide and then I'll go back. Chemically, um, we have basically two options. We have glyphosate and we have a mazepair. So for large areas and we need to broadcast, we're looking at upwards of four pounds of active ingredient per acre. So that's basically for most of our Glyphosate solutions, that's about a gallon per acre. A mazapir, you're looking at a pound per acre. The reason I gave it in pounds per acre for both of these is because formulations differ uh, among trade names, but also with a mazapir, there's different concentrations um, from a two pound to a four pound. So if you're not careful, you can really over apply a mazapir, and that can be problematic because a mazapir has a lot of soil residual activity. And so it could mean if you want to replant or reestablish native species back in that area, it could take you much longer. All right. Um, so spot treatment, I'm using usually a 3% solution of glyphosate or 1% solution of imazapir. I get a lot of questions. Well, can I combine them? Some people do. Here's my take on this. If you're gonna combine the two, you add a mazapir to glyphosate, do not add glyphosate to a mazapir. Does that make any sense? Probably not. If I had to choose one over the other, I would choose a mazapir. 
the reasons I would not use a mazepir is if I'm near desirable trees or desirable species that I want to keep just because of the residual. Glyphosate's going to kill everything too, but a mazepir is much more uh, difficult to deal with as far as sensitivity to some of our native species. Um, but overall, a lot of people look for that silver bullet that doesn't exist. And they say, well, I'm going to wait till University of Florida comes up with that magical herbicide. Well, we don't do that. We test things that come from chemical companies, but we don't um, develop new chemicals. And overall retreatment, it must, 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 must be part of your plan. You can't spray it once and walk away. Sometimes you can get lucky and spray one patch. It'll never come back. You have a patch 50 feet away from the other patch and you'll go back three years in a row and it's still coming back. So there's no rhyme or reason to it. You just have to keep going back and scouting and reapplying until you don't see it coming back again. So as far as the best method, <clears throat> I think you need to follow an integrated approach. So if, I think the best thing is burning, usually sometime in August, let it regrow till it's need a waist high, and then you either use glyphosate and amazepir. Then once we get, <clears throat> excuse me, into the dry season, start tillage. And this is just not a lackadaisical till tillage. This is something that's deep and it's repeated. This is, this is something you want to happen over and over and over again, especially during the dry season. Because remember I said about 80 to 90% of the rice, uh, the plant's biomass is below ground. That's what we're trying to dry out. We're trying to kill those rhizomes to keep those from regerminating. If you can't burn um, and you have to mow, I don't really like mowing all that much because the thatch stays on top of the cogan grass. You don't get the herbicide onto the actively growing parts of the plant. So I don't like it, but if you can't burn, that is an option. Okay. So the, the purpose of burning and mowing too is to initiate re regrowth from the rhizomes. So I don't know if I can explain this very well up here, but basically if I stretch out my arms and I'm the mother Kogan grass plant. Okay. If I get sprayed or I burned, I've released, Kogan grass has what they call apical dominance. So if I'm a mother Kogan grass plant, my root system's here. I'm controlling my root system. Once I'm removed from the situation by burning and rowing, that apical dominance is removed. That allows more shoots to come up on my root system. So you initiate more growth off the root system. So then you're getting more herbicide into the rhizomes, theoretically. And then when you finally get to the tillage part, you're going to have more <clears throat> ability to kill more of that rhizome system. All right. I don't want to talk about cutting grass anymore. It's depressing. My next depressing species, it's smut grass. Um, this is one that, so the station was started in 1941 here. And about the 1950s, they started working on smut grass management. And in 2022, we're still working on smut grass management, if that tells you any stories. We do have two species in Florida, giant and small smut grass, small smut grass. You pretty much tell them by the seed head. Small smut grass is on the left here. Giant smut grass is on the right. Um, as far as control goes, it really doesn't matter. Both species react pretty similarly to hexazinone, which is Velpar or tied hexar. This needs to be applied during the rainy season. The reason is, is because there's not much foliar activity with this herbicide. It has to be taken up through the root system. So you need the rainfall to get it to the roots to be taken up. And there is no grazing restrictions with this, but there are some haying restrictions. So I'm not going to show you all the data that my programs put together over the last 15, 16, 17 years now. 
Uh, but basically what we've determined is two year programs are better than the one year walk away. So what we've seen is if you go out two years in a row uh, with either a full rate followed by a full rate or a full rate followed by a, maybe a half to three quarter rate, you end up with better long-term control than spraying at once and walking away for three years. Because by year three, you're usually back to what it looked like in year one. It doesn't take long for smut grass to take back over. When should renovation occur? Usually, if you can't take a step in the pasture without stepping on smut grass, you have a problem. So, so you're usually more than 70% at that point, but at least 70% of the pasture is infested. You probably should be looking at a renovation and then follow that up the year after reseeding with another herbicide application. I don't know where we'll go to on our tour today, but our neighbor to the south, they planted watermelons a year ago. They reseeded last July. It already looks horrible. Like they could go renovate again in some, in some portions of that pasture. It is amazing how quickly smut grass has taken that back over. Uh, so I talked about amazapir being leth lethal to some of our hardwoods. Hexazinone is lethal to oak trees. So that's something to take into account. And then, like I said, rainfall is necessary, but too much is bad too. And that's where we kind of get into a pickle. And another reason I talk about two year programs versus one year is because we're trying to spread out our risk over multiple years. And I just wanted to show real quick. Uh, we went out every week starting in April a few years ago and sprayed hexazinone or Velpar and then measured rainfall for that seven days after that application. So the blue bars represent control of the smut grass, the orange line or yellow, whatever it looks like in your screen, uh, represents the rainfall in inches and then just our application dates. So what I wanted to point out is in cases where no rainfall, very little control. Excessive rainfall, only 50% control. No rainfall again in July, um, very poor control. But if you look across the whole grand scheme of things, it doesn't look very consistent anyway, does it? And that's something that we found with their server side is it's not consistent. And it, a lot of times it can not only be due to excessive rainfall, it can be due to not enough mo soil moisture or excessive soil moisture. So there's a lot more variables that go into the consistency of this. And I think that's why we struggle with this. And that's why I'm still working on it today, uh, trying to figure out the best ways to increase the consistency of this herbicide, because it's the only one we have that controls smut grass selectively. All right. I believe this is the last um, one that I have data on. I'm going to talk about a couple others, uh, but I'm not going to share a lot of data on those. This one is Caesar weed. Um, pretty much everybody probably knows this. If you go in the woods, it attacks you. You carry the seeds off with it, with your with your clothes or your hair if you have any. Um, but anyway, you're looking at plants to go from five to ten feet tall get fairly woody by the by August and you would think fairly difficult to control most woody species tend to be fairly difficult to control so when we started working on this we were thinking more than likely it's going to be remedy um, or pasture guard another product that contains the same active as remedy to really take take hold of this plant so this was actually on the center um, these trees no longer exist as of the spring because we harvested them, but this perfect environment for Caesar weed grew really well there. And this is about the time we treated it. So it was very tall. And 30 days after treatment, pasture guard, which is PTG at one and two pints, weed are, which is 2,4-D and dicamba at one and two quarts, remedy, which is triclopyr at one and two pints all provided at least 90% control at 30 days. And then we have Milestone, which is just straight amino pyrrolin, and then another product that's never gonna be labeled for pasture, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, 
who weren't doing as well at 30 days. So I thought, well, we have our answer is Remedy, Weedar, or Pashagar. And I said Weedar was 240 and Dicamin, it's just straight 240, my bad. Um, so I thought we had our three products. You go out 60 days, everything we sprayed resulted in 100% kill. And that, that shocked me and that shocked a lot of my colleagues because we always said glyphosate and amazepir is the only thing that's going to take care of Caesar weed. But we, we do have something that's somewhat selective uh, depending on what your target species are. All right. Um, one that I'm starting to fear more and more every day. When I first started here, it was a very South Florida issue and a very North Florida issue. Japanese climbing fern from the north, old world climbing fern from the south. Well, they're converging upon one another today and we're fighting this in a lot of different places. I see this along Highway 98 going from 27 to Okeechobee like crazy. I see this all the way up Highway 441. Basically almost every wetland is prone to being infested by this Ligodium. Um, so how do we control it? I think if you look at the bottom right picture, where it's actually growing along the ground on mats, that's easy. It's a foliar application. I say easy, I wouldn't want to spray that, but I mean, it can be done fairly easy. When it starts climbing trees, like it's in the bottom right and then over on the left where it's climbing these cypress trees in the cypress dome, it becomes a little bit more difficult. That's where, uh, Contractor crews are going in and poodle cutting about waist high all the way around those trees and spraying the lower part and leaving the upper part alone. So what they're trying to do is control the rhizome. Much like Kogan grass, you're trying to control the rhizome. So they're using glyphosate, they're using um, Escort, which is metsulfuron, and they're also investigating a new product called Procellachlor for Japanese climbing fern. I may have this backwards or old water climbing fern. It's one or the other, um, but one's tolerant to prosocor and the other one isn't. They're also looking at some different triclopyr formulations on that as well. And the last species that I wanted to mention is one that is frustrates me quite a bit as well, called whitehead broom. Um, this was a success story for a different reason for a biocontrol agent that controlled mole crickets and bahia grass. In my point of view, it's no longer a success story because I can't kill it selectively. So this is something that I continue to work on. Um, I get frustrated with it and I back off for a year and rethink about my approach and then go back at it. So this year we're going back at it again. We're trying some different strategies, maybe using a liquid fertilizer as a carrier instead of just mixing the herbicide and water. That's something we're working on. We do see some selectivity in some of our improved hybrid Bermuda grass and star grass and limpo grass with um, escort at, at high rates. And Bahia grass, we're limited to Belpar, which does act, have activity on it selectively, but pretty much I think all we're doing is burning the top growth. We're not killing the root system. So it's coming right back from the root system. So I think I've probably gone over, but they said I could have extra time, so that's their fault. <laughs> um, any questions or I'll be here all day. Yes. Johnson grass. Did I talk about Johnson grass? Oh, you have a different handout. Okay. That 1.3, I think I know what it is. No, I've got it. It's Outrider, Outrider herbicide. Yeah, Outrider herbicide is, is what it is. Yes, sir.
So has IFAS taken a position on applications of glyphosate across the state? Good, bad, or yeah. So there is a fact sheet on that. Um, I can dig it up, but basically I can tell you, it says that we follow what the EPA says. If the EPA says that it's safe and it's labeled in the state of Florida, then we're gonna follow that and say that it can be used as part of our recommendations. So we don't say you have to use this. So it's much like Maria said earlier, these are recommendations that come forth based on our research. So that's where those come from. Anything else? It's a good question, thank you. All right, thank you.